Bob Lear is a lost township, tucked away in the trees, just a stone's throw from the road between Ullapool and Inverness at Inverlaw. Centuries of history lie buried and forgotten. In this series, with the help of Ullapool Museum, archaeologists and historical experts, we're bringing the people and stories of Balblair and Inverlaw back to life. Eight snapshots, reimagined moments in Highland history, which have, until recently, been hidden in plain sight. Episode 7. George Stuart Mackenzie of Cool. George Stuart Mackenzie is the second to last baronet of Cool. He took over from his father, who was Sir Major Alexander Mackenzie of Cool, in 1796 as the kind of Laird of the Mackenzies of Cool. But when we speak about Lairds in this time sense, we are talking rich Edinburgh landowners, not clan chiefs, even though historically his position would have been a clan chief. He is important to this because he owns the land by proxy. His mum technically owns the land, but while she receives the benefits from the area, he's in control of it. It's him pulling all the strings. And he is who triggers the clearance of 1819 and 1820. And that's why he is a key part of this story and how the landscape changes. Did you think I did not ken that you would stand in judgment afore me? I, George Stuart Mackenzie, seventh baronet of Cool, laird, proprietor, traveller, scientist. So let the trial begin, do your worst. Speak, you spectres of the future, free for it and ayont. But appraise me impartially, I beg. This is, was my town. My kith and my kin, my life. I did what I considered to be right and propitious. There were hard times. This time we're looking is when the Enlightenment was starting to take hold in Edinburgh. And George Stewart absolutely styles himself as a man of the Enlightenment. He is an improver. He is a scientist, a geographer, a geologist, a anatomist at times as well. He genuinely sees himself as one of these new men that is coming out of Edinburgh at that time. Burns, Walter Scott, these are the type of people he would be influenced by, be socialising with, bouncing ideas off each other. The absolute heart of the Scottish Enlightenment. Am I allowed to put my case in this eldritch court? This is my crime. I enacted a policy calculated to increase the happiness of people. My only intention, to promote the general prosperity of my land, my clan, my tenants. I acted with forethought and empathy. Every care was taken to clarify the benefits to those who needed to be removed. We gave fair warning, a good time in advance, in writing, in instructions by factors. I am a just and for it thinking landlord. It's probably quite... um small landowner in terms of Highland lands, but the lands that he does own are quite lucrative. All the parcels of land are farmland. So even though it's not particularly big land, it would have been very valuable. Valuable? Therein lies the question it had been. And it felt to me to make it so again. You must understand these lands and their value not only belong to me, but our home, to me, to my family, my people. Everything I did, I did for what I loved and believed in. I cannot figure out whether I like him or not. (laughs) And because of that, it gives me this curiosity. On an emotional level, you should really dislike him because he cleared a lot of his land with Inverlaw. Maybe about 400 people were taken off the land that they'd lived on for hundreds of years. He essentially writes the handbook on how to clear your land. In that area, he's not a very likeable person. But there are real elements of humanity within him that I find 
totally intriguing and totally contrasting to this other side. In one of his books, he talks about Ullapool and how the British Fisheries Society has really done Ullapool dirty because they have made absolutely no effort to put in any additional industry and relied far too heavily on the fishing. So when the fishing fails, it leaves Ullapool absolutely destitute. And he is really, really critical on the way that the British Fishery Society have handled this. He is, seems to be very much on the side of the people in Ullapool. He also talks about later on his relationship with his own tenants and why he wouldn't prosecute his tenants for illicit whiskey distilling. He's very, very clear and very, very publicly saying that was he a magistrate, he would not be fining tenants for producing illicit whiskey and not paying the tax on them because he feels that it is not conducive to a good working environment for the tenants or for a relationship between the landowners and the tenants because, in his words, if he'd fine them for producing this whiskey, then they just wouldn't pay their rent. So why would he put himself into hardship when the people that really should be ones that are prosecuted for this are the smugglers? Others were guiltier of wrongdoing than I. No, no, the happiness of the people and their improvement were the sole objects of my actions. Whiskey! The law can be an ass, but we must change those laws that hold back progress, not break them. Haruskave was not only uncogged and wholesome, fresh from the bonniest water in all Scotland, it was also profitable, and should be for the mackers as well as the owners. Decent, honest men must be allowed to make their living. I think he sees himself as having the collective moral conscience for the area, this kind of father figure that he knows best. Part of that is an idea that crofting or the way that they were living in Inverloch at the time is not a viable occupation. And there is an element that he believes that if he freed them from this kind of perpetual sustainability circle that they currently live in, that they could go get proper jobs. He sees them as stuck. He prides himself on knowing about his people and knowing how the land works and knowing the science behind it. It might be brutal, it might be kind of tough love approach, but it is for their own good. Naturally, I was met in some quarters with opposition to any change whatsoever. Let me be plain. There were feckless men among the industrious, Indolent men happy to burden their daily work upon their wives and children and let their betters provide for them. Men who had no interest in improving their condition, content with hod and grey and poultry fare, no advancement if it came to the cost of sacrificing what they believed were ancient customs or leaving the homes of their ancestors. Neither coast nor village nor adventure across the Atlantic could prize them from the old ways. They could not see, though it was plain as day. Their lives were barren and bereft. Their herds of kai were of the poorest description. They endured a scanty sustenance with much toil and labour. The livestock provided poorly and died young. It is a business, and we do know that as you go through the early... 1800s up until probably the 1850s, that the condition of the estate of Cool in its entirety starts to diminish. Our first kind of indication that something might be wrong is 1806, when we see an argument between George Stuart Mackenzie and his mum, Dame Catherine, about the lands that she owns. We know that Inverlaw was one of these lands that is in her name, but through the marriage contract, they're arguing whether her lands now take up too much of the entire estate and that she should have to reduce her share so the estate can get more and it doesn't go to her. It's then this slow build up until we get the clearance in the 1819, 1820 and everything just starts to go downhill slowly, slowly, very much from there. We can also see from George Mackenzie's own accounts that his son, Robert, 
is systematically bleeding the estate dry, almost like cashing in his inheritance and using it up before he's even got it. By the time that George Stewart dies, the estate is significantly less than it was when he inherited it. By reading his works, you can see that he's a very proud man. He's very self-assured, very confident at the start. I think as this time would have went on, he would have probably started to feel slightly more disheartened as it went along, that his idea of this perfect utopian new idea, new way of living, wasn't quite living up to what he thought it was going to. And you can just see that little spark a little bit is gone. That makes me a little bit sad because you see, even though there's obviously very big, difficult topics surrounding him, but he had that energy, that fullness that doesn't seem to be there at the end. <sighs> the land, though it grieves my heart, had become unfit for the habitation of man. I watched as, thanks to outmoded practices, crops failed for several winters in a row. I witnessed the people's wretchedness with great sorrow as they suffered the extremes of want and of human misery. My decisions were momentous and disrupting, but they were not taken alone. The courts, the parliament, lairds across the hail of Scotland all agreed. Taxmen and tenants were consulted. Time was given. The burden upon we proprietors to whom the land rightly belongs needed sorely to be lifted, lest all would be pauperised. I had troubles and cares of my ain in those days. A boy, my heir, unthrifty, a scandal maker, blades sunk deep in the hearts of myself and his mother. The people were removed and the mountains repopulated with sheep, rending the land profitable and giving erstwhile tenants alternate opportunities whereby they could obtain a decent livelihood. They've got this man who's clearly struggling now and you want to feel kind of empathy for him, but at the same time, you know the horrible things that have happened. He's cleared the land, he's put an end to 5,000 years of occupation from this site and it's never going to recover after this. He is the end point of the story of Inverlal for the most part. He's such a complex man. He has lots of different layers. And to understand the clearance at the time, I think you need to understand the man himself. They left as they were instructed. In general, they did so finally in an orderly and peaceable manner. The old tune is quiet now. Mere stones, ghostly shapes of times gone by, never to return. They've spread far and wide. I hope, free the bottom of my hair, that they flourish. Now I can find and see from this very spot where the weaker ones, the old, lacking the wherewithal and vivacity, now gather cockles and lock brooms far shore. All I desired was a solution to our predicament. Every aid was given through the bounty of my estate. Still there was, unavoidably, venom, distress and complaint about inevitable decisions justly made and that I, Will Ken, will echo down the generations. In Hidden in Plain Sight, the expert was Siobhan Beetson, the writer was Chris Dolan, and the actor was David Heyman. Hidden in Plain Sight was produced by Adventurous Audio Limited, and made possible thanks to the support of the Audio Content Fund.